Okay, so I want to welcome you to class number four of Bible study methods. And tonight uh, we are going into the second phase of Bible study methods. But um, I told you, uh, looking at your book tonight, uh, we're going to look at a few things. Tonight we're going to talk about interpretation. Um, you were supposed to do your um, memory scripture, right? What's the memory scripture for this week? Week number four. Come on, Sister Sarah. I know you got it. Huh? No. Oh. Is that it? Sure about that? All right. So we're going to look at it. It should be Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, your memory scripture was what? Second Peter chapter what? All right. And what? And, and did you do it? Did you do it? All right. If you didn't do it, that's okay. All right. Make sure you, you get your memory scriptures down because it's important as you learn the word of God. Okay. So, let's do this. Let's pray tonight. We'll get started, and we'll go into uh, interpretation tonight. We're going to talk. We're still going to discuss a little bit about observation. We're going to look at the process that we've been looking at on Bible study methods. Um, and uh, tonight, we're going to have a good time, all right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and kindness tonight, Lord. We ask that you would bless our time together. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Create in us, Lord, a clean heart and renewing us a right spirit tonight. Father, I pray for these students that you would bless them, uh, encourage them, enlighten them, Lord Father God, and use me tonight for your glory. God, uh, you are the, Ho the Holy Spirit is the teacher tonight, and we're praying tonight for your power and presence in this place. We love you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God. All right. So, uh, your scripture, your memory scripture is 2 Peter chapter 1, right? Verse 20 and 21. And it's a great passage of scripture because it actually is dealing with what we're going to talk about tonight as far as interpretation. It says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own what? Interpretation. Now, that, when we start talking about interpretation... Now, I told you, um, if you pay attention to the screen, that there, well, I, I just want to deal with the three steps. We'll deal with the last one uh, at the end, but I told you that there, the steps to studying, the steps to taking a passage, um, last night we talked about in our uh, Principles of Teaching class, I gave you the, the blueprint, basically. Uh, I gave you the blueprint on how to take a passage and how to begin to formulate a message out of it, right? I, I, you know, I think it's clear. I believe it was clear. And, uh, but the first step before you put a message together is, the, is what this class is all about, right? Is understanding how to study a passage, okay? That we discussed is that... Uh, last night is that when you get to a passage of scripture uh, one of the things that you're trying to do is determine the background to the scripture the background to the passage understanding what's going on and how do you do that what do you do that that step is called what observation so the so whenever you approach a passage right you approach a passage uh, you you approach the passage by saying you know what I have to first observe the passage first before I do anything else my first task is to 
observe the passage. And, and remember, remember this sheet of paper I gave you? Remember this sheet of paper? Look, I put everything on the screen for you now. All right? Uh, here it is. Uh, the first question, these are the questions that you want to ask, right? These are the questions you want to ask when you're looking at a passage, right? Who is the author? Uh, who is the author addressing God's people, a specific church? Uh, what are the main verbs? And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, I'm kind of cover a little bit about observation. But what I said earlier is that you, you take these... Um, you take these questions, you know, and type them up. Maybe, maybe tape them in your Bible, in, in the front of your Bible or something like that. So whenever you sit to study. See, here's the thing. Studying has to become a way of life. It really has. You know, after you take this class, I hope and I pray that you will be able to continue studying. Um, when you don't, when you need answers in your life, when you don't understand what's going on, you need direction from God. You need to make a decision. You, you are struggling with certain things in your life. Um, remember, this is not just you learning about a method so that you can sound good when you teach, or you know, or whatever the whatever your reason is for taking this class, but you are wanting to become better at studying God's word and so that you can glean life truths from there so that you can become the person that God wants you to be. See, uh, the, uh, you're studying. Listen, uh, yesterday, unfortunately. Now, yesterday I, sh I, I told you that, uh, not yes, yeah, yes, last night, uh, in the Tuesday night class, I told you that one of the commentaries that you use in order to find out who the author is and who who's he writing to and all this stuff is the Bible Knowledge Commentary, right? And if you have this software here, this is called this is called Word Search. Uh, you go right here to Intro, and what it does, it actually tells you, you know, who the author is, the purpose for for the writing. Okay. The purpose for the writing, when it was written, the date it was written, and things like that. Okay, that's where you find that information. Okay, and I told you last night you may want to go pick up a copy, uh, or if you have the software, if you want to purchase the software, you can get it. But uh, get a Bible knowledge commentary because you're going to need some aids in interpretation. That's what we're going to deal with tonight. We use commentaries to interpret the scripture. Okay, and we also use just the first part of the commentary to find out the author, who the recipients were. I told you at CBD they have a. They, I I I have the the book volume. I haven't used it in many many years, and no, you can't have it, brother Ronnie. And uh, <laughs> uh, but what you do is you you can order the, the double volume set. It's fifty nine dollars, but it's a great investment. Okay, it's a great investment. It's called the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And there are other commentaries that work well. But this is what I do first when I'm trying to find out who the author is and stuff like that. Or you can use a study Bible, all right? Uh, John MacArthur's study Bible is a good one. It's a great one uh, that you can use to start finding out who the author is, the date. I'll give you another nugget. Uh, it's called the New King James Study Bible. It's called the Nelson Study Bible. That's a great, great resource. It's called a Nelson Study Bible. And I have that, I have that particular on, I have that also on, on the computer. No, I, I mean, you can use his too, R.C. Sproul, yeah, you can use his too, yeah. You know, I, I no, he, but he, he didn't write that, he didn't write that, uh, this one, uh, the uh, Nelsons, no, he didn't. So, um, so when when we talked about these questions, right? We asked, okay, who is the author of the passage? Uh, who is the who? Whom is the author addressing? God's people, a specific church, or unbelievers? Uh, what is the most important term or concept in the passage? What are the main verbs? Okay, and what is the verb tenses? Now. 
remember when we looked at Psalm 90, 90, 93 last week, right? We look at Psalm 93, we, we did that exercise in observation, right? We started to look at the passage. We weren't trying to interpret the passage. I'm sorry, yeah, we weren't trying to interpret the passage. What we were doing is observing the passage. Now, a good rule of thumb is this. All right, so when I look at my passage, the first thing I do, if you get a piece of paper or have, or have if you want to type it or whatever you put, you put number one, my author. You write down your author. So, for instance, your homework assignment was 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. All right? Who's the author? Okay. All right. Who is John address? Who is the author addressing? <laughs> uh, no. Well, well, yes, because because the story begins in Genesis. This is a good. This passage is a great illustration as to the differences that you will have when you're doing observation. But here's the thing, right? When you went, the, the passage is 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. It says, not as Cain, who was the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slew, slay, slay him? Because his deeds were what? His deeds were evil. Here are a few suggestions, again, by using the observation of passage scripture sheet, which is on the screen, right? This time you should find more more significance in the author, the context, and the people mentioned. Regarding context, any time a verse begins in the midsection, you have a clear mandate to take note of what precedes it. So, if your passage is in the middle. If your passage starts in the middle, you always want to go back and read what happened before. In observation, that's your context, all right? So before I jump ahead of myself here, um, let, me, let me just pull it up here. 1 John uh, chapter what, 3, verse 12, okay? All right, let's look at it, all right? Now, so what we must do is say, okay, this passage is planted right in the middle of something that was said before. Because, I mean, look at it. It says, not as Cain. I mean, it tells you that something is being said before. The question is what? What? So here's a good, here's a good thing with observation, okay? Here's a great exercise, a great rule of thumb. You want to read what happens before, but you want to kind of get a feel for what happened in the chapter before that, okay? But before you read before the chapter of all that, the first thing you have to get is the big idea of what's going on in this verse, all right? So, when we go back to verse 1, what, what, is, the, what is the whole theme for chapter 3? See, this is what I like about the New American Standard Bible. Or, or the big idea. Remember remember, remember that sheet I gave you on the big idea? Well, no, that was not in this class. That was in the other class, right? So here it is. The big idea of chapter 3 is what? Children of God love one another. So I'm, getting, I'm already in my mind's eyes and in my sanctified imagination, I'm already thinking... This has something to do with love. It, it definitely has something to do with love, right? So as I'm looking at this now, it says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called what? Children of God. And such we are for this reason the world does not know us because... It did not what? Know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Now, there are a couple things I want to say this, say to you before I keep reading here. First of all, I see something in verse 1. See that word see? Another conversation. Something was said what? 
before the sea. All right, now I'm not going to go there just yet because we want to keep rolling, but he says, he's not saying that we're never going to sin, okay? So don't, don't, uh, don't underestimate what the pastor is saying here. We're at 70 now, so I think we're good. All right. Go ahead, my brother. Sin is of the devil. My God. So the devil has sinned from the beginning. So, so now look. So the person who practices sin. See, it, he's not saying we're not going to sin. But he, in context, he's saying that the one who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Right? But he also says that the one who practices righteousness is what? Right. And is of God. So there's a difference here, right? There's a, there's, there's a contrast going on here in the passage, right? Now, remember, as you're reading, you're making observations, right? Like, okay, man, there's, there's, there's a contrast. He's talking about, uh, he addressed in verse 7, he says, little children, right? You know, John sees us as children, right? Uh, he says, because we are children of God, right? And not only that, but, but the people of God, right? And, but he also says the one who practices sin is what? What do you think that means? <laughs> well, I, I believe it means that you're fellowshipping. The one who's practicing sin. The one that's practicing sin. That could be a believer. Yeah. You can fellowship with All right. But he says the one who practices sin is not of God. So now is he talking about an unbeliever or is he talking about a believer here? Oh, this, this is talking about an unbeliever. It's got to be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> See, because, and it's not fellowship, it's nature. Because as an unbeliever, it's in our nature to what? To sin. But it's also in our nature as believers to sin, but we catch ourselves and we what? We repent and we stop practicing it. See, we have the power to do that as believers. That's the fellowship and the relationship thing we talked about the other day. Go ahead, go ahead. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works. So of why did Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil? Right. But there's something interesting here. It says, no, verse 6, right at the very top. No one who abides in him. Sin. That's right. Practicing of sin. Okay? If we abide in him, the Holy Spirit will be in us so very strong, so very strongly. And when I say that, I mean in the sense of being filled that we would be immune, we would not want to abide in sin, but abide in him. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you want and it shall be given, right? Okay, so he says, he says, little children, uh, he, says, he says, no one who abides in him sins. And no one who sins has what? Seen him or knows him, Right? Read on. Now, 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 let me say this. Right at verse 7, it tells us something. It tells us that the Son of God appeared for this purpose. What purpose did the Son of Man appear for? To destroy the, work to destroy the what? The work. 
Now, I want to remember this, okay? Now, remember this. When you're reading a passage, okay, these are things that you need to, like, highlight, underline, pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on in the passage because, because what's going on in the passage, it will give you a, a clue. Okay, it will start cluing you in as to what the what the writer is trying to say ultimately. Okay? Now, watch this. Watch what he says. Verse 8. Uh, did we read verse 8? Verse, verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. Hold on a minute. 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 Let me see something here. No one who is born of God sins. Huh? We might sin, but we don't practice. Oh, baby, we practice sin. <laughs> you better believe that. <laughs> There's some that what we should not. I bet you you sin today. <laughs> In thought, <laughs> some of us overate today. <laughs> All right, you know I'm just saying. So didn't pray this morning. You know what I mean? You know, uh, you know things like that. What I'm saying is, here's what I'm trying to say. There's something we're going to get into this here in a minute. But he says. He says, no one who is born of God practices sin. Why? Because his seed, which seed? God. Seed of God. The word of God, the Holy Spirit, right? The blood of Jesus Christ that forgave us of our original sin, right? He says, the, because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin, because he is what? Born of God. So is it saying we practice sin or we sin? Excuse me? You tell me. You're doing the observation. Okay. It well, says, uh, it's, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't cut you off. It says that we don't practice sin. We sin, but it says here we don't practice it. And you said earlier. We should, we should we not, not oh, okay. practice it. But in all reality, remember what he's saying. Remember what John, see, here's the thing. The, the, if you think that you're going to not sin ever again, well, we're going to sin. But but it's the practice. It, it is a difference. See, the difference. Practice means. means. I mean, you set out to sin. So that's willing. Well, yeah, well I, 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 don't, I think that for some people. It's certain things that they have gotten accustomed to and getting away with it. They don't want to change. The heart. See, and that's what we've been talking about in counseling. That's, as a matter of fact, this is exactly what we talked about Monday night in counseling. When the heart doesn't change, the person refuses to stop practicing immorality. All right, and he continues to exist in that in that state, okay, without understanding that he has the seed of God in him. See, when we fall short, the Holy Spirit is in us, <laughs> you know. And I said this on Monday. I think sometimes when people fall when people fall into their into, into practicing sin, uh, they they think God doesn't see. <laughs> That, you know, oops, he, he, he ain't going to see this time. Or, you know, oops, I didn't mean. You know, our mental attitude sometimes. Mm -hmm. We can sin with our mental attitude. Yes. And that's real. That, that, that's, it happens. Okay, but, but he's not telling us we ought to be perfect because we will not reach perfection until we get to heaven. But in the meantime, right, According to this passage, he says that if you're born of God, your desire, if you're truly born of God, the desire to practice it 
No, it will it will begin to subside. It will begin to, to if you're walking in the Spirit, if you're living in the Spirit, and if you're being led by the Spirit of God, you, sin is not going to be as attractive to you. Huh? Yeah, that's right, you know. And so, so he says, he says, the one who, the one who's born of God. The key word here is that he says, the one who's born of God does not what practice it. See, now I'm di- now. Remember what we're doing. We're just observing the passage, right? You're not trying to get no deep meaning out of it just yet, but. These things are clues in observation and you reading the passage to say, you know what, man, there's something going on in this passage. I need to pay close attention to what's happening, writing down certain things, you know, okay, wow, this is pretty cool, because I'll show you why here in a few minutes. There you go. Well, remember, we talked about demonic faith, we talked about dead faith, and we talked about uh, no faith. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so the thing about that is some people, uh, they profess, but they have not been, they, they, they confess, but they have not really been converted. You follow what I'm saying? They know about Jesus. You see, when Jesus comes in your life, really comes into your heart you do have the power to change you see the Holy Spirit is the change agent in your heart in your life now the word of God begins to transform you this is why I believe the greatest thing that you can ever do with your life is learn how to study God's word you see because here's the reason why because as you get deeper into God's word it's a mirror See and what I and see in 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 theory that sounds good, but in practicality at times, some of us can't grasp it. You see, we we, we think, uh, well, I know the steps. I, I I know a lot of people have taken these classes. They know the steps of studying the Word of God, right? Yeah. But when it comes down to actually practicing it in their lives. It's one of the hardest things for them to do. Why do you think it is? I believe that either they are still practicing (laughs) sin or they've broken fellowship with God. Uh, They have not been taught properly. I was watching something uh, yesterday. I'm going to use it for my next class. The next class I'm teaching is Worldview. And, and boy, I tell you, uh, worldview class is an amazing class because it, it, it opens your eyes. And 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 um, people like, uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, if you like them, uh, you know, it's all good, you know. People like Benny Hinn, who emotionalize people and never offer them Jesus. <laughs> you know, that's... that's Good example, you know what I mean? Churches that use all the the emotional stuff to draw a crowd in, and then they and then people they start doing life together, but nobody's never said, you know, are you saved? <laughs> you know, just because you stop doing something by willpower because you're hanging around positive people or Christians doesn't mean you're saved. See? Uh, It's a transformed life that says that you're really saved. You follow what I'm saying? Exactly. You know, and and, and if you look at this here, you have to ask yourself, which seed is in you? Because look what he says before. He says... He says, again, the one who practices sin 
is of the devil. He is of the devil. That's deep. That's deep to me. You know, you know, this, this I mean, God's word is so amazing, but when you read stuff like that, you're like, man, that's kind of harsh. How many people, how many sermons have you heard? <laughs> well, the preacher say you your daddy is the devil. Oh, you're of the devil. You do that today, guess what's going to happen? You ain't going to have no church. Okay? Because they don't want, people don't want to, the new thing that they, people don't want to be preached at anymore. See, but, but what do you do? Uh, what do you do in a situation like this? Well, it tells us we shouldn't be surprised when a person is practicing sin and you're wondering, man, why aren't they changing? Because their daddy is the devil. They are of the devil. And they're doing it for the devil. Look. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has what? Sin from the beginning. But the Son of Man appeared for this purpose. What purpose? To destroy. Come on. You know, I was driving here, and I said, God, I said, is it possible today to just preach the word and people come by the droves to hear what you have to say? Or do we have to put on a show to get them there, and that's the only way we're going to get them there to listen to your word? See, those are good questions. Those are things I go through in my mind asking, you know, I ask these questions, you know, like, is, is the word not good enough? You know, I, I look, look what he says. He says, he says, by this, now, 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 see, this is the part that I really love about this passage. Verse 9, no one who's born of God practices sin because his seed abides where? And he what? Now, it's not saying that you will not sin, but you're not going to be practicing it on a daily, on a, you know, certain things on a daily basis. Okay? But you know, this is saying he cannot sin. I understand that. And, and it's not saying absolutely, though. Okay? But he's saying in the, because of the context. All right, and because we know theologically, all right, now you got to use some of your theology here, okay, and say, okay, well, first of all, I'm still in this body, right. all right, and I, and and Paul says I, we we haven't reached perfection yet, so some of this requires your theology, your a theological foundation, because just like because you can read this out of context and start saying, you know what, I can't sin no more. And then guess what? You're going to go out there, and you're going to think you can't sin. You're going to put yourself in a situation, and guess what's going to happen? Boom, you're going to fall. Okay? But let's read on, and I'll show you this. He says he cannot sin because what? He is born of what? Of God. By this, the children of God, by what? I know, but by what? By this. What's this? What's the this? Well, the fact that you're born of God, right? Exactly. By this, the children of God and the children are what? Are what? Now, where did you see that before? Where did you see that phrase before? Let me see if I got any Bible readers in here. Have you seen that phrase before? Nope. Well, you see that in Galatians 5, where he says the deeds of the flesh are evident, and the fruits of the spirits 
the fruit of the spirit are evident too. He says the deeds of the flesh are what? Are evident. Right? And so what he's saying here is that you can literally discern and tell a person who is born of God, clearly, and one who is of the devil. Very clearly. He says, watch what he says. He says, by this we know that the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice what? See that? See it again? Is what? Nor the one who does not what? Now. This passage, even though we're dealing with sin, the bigger issue here is not about sin. It's about love. <laughs> That's the bigger issue here. And what he's saying is, the one who does not love his brother. Now, this word brother has nothing to do with my blood brother has everything to do with my brother or sister in Christ. Now watch this. It says, for this is the message, now that you have the context, this is the message which you have heard from the beginning. From what beginning? There you go. When God says, you know, you, know, you, should, you, should, you should love with all your heart, with all your soul, and what's the second to that? Love your neighbor as what? As, as, your, as yourself. Right? He says, For this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. Now watch this. Not as Cain who was... Now, what he's doing now in this passage, right now, he's given us an illustration of what it looks like to be unrighteous and to be righteous. You, you follow? And that's what he's doing here in this passage in observation. Now watch this. He says, not as Cain. Now what did Cain do? All right, now how many did your homework? All right, all right. What, what, hap what happened with Cain? Why did he kill his brother? Out of jealousy. Because, because, and, and let me say this about Cain and Abel, okay? Remember this. It shows you a couple things with Cain and Abel. Number one, it shows you that man is born, but he has a choice. Abel... was righteous. But what made him righteous? He brought his best to God. He reverenced God. He didn't even know God, but he reverenced, he knew him, but he reverenced him. But here's the brother, right? Are you, are you getting the picture now? Here's, here's Cain, who is of the devil, <laughs> And here's Abel, who's what? Of God. So watch this. The deeds of the flesh are evident. Jealousy. Outbursts of anger. The fruit of spirit, love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Faithfulness, self-control, that's long-suffering, right? Gentleness, right? Now watch this. So when you look at both brothers, you see one who was born of God and one who was born of what? So what he's saying is to us, 
We don't want to be like Cain. <laughs> but we want to be like Abel. But don't be fooled by those who pretend to be righteous and their deeds don't follow. You, 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 you follow what I'm saying? The, the greater thing here is love. And when you can love those who hurt you and love those who persecute you. Look what he says. He says, not as Cain, who was, e who was the evil one, and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were what? And his brothers were what? So what he's saying in context, look at the deeds of a person. Come on, help me somebody. And you will be able to know who they are. That's just observation. Look, listen, if a person comes to you and says, you know what, I, I want to sell you this. Right? And you watch their actions and you watch how they went to somebody else and say, hey, you know what? I want to sell you the same thing. He want to sell you the same thing that he sold him and he hadn't even given him this yet. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? His deeds does not match up. See, and what, what, he, what, what the, the bigger picture here is, man, when you look at a person, like, you have to discern. Is their actions lining up? Is their walk lining up with their talk? What, 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 and I think what, what, what's, what we see here in this passage and in relation to what you're talking about, yeah. what God is showing us there is that even an unsaved person has a choice to do right. Right, because that's what I told him also. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. But some people, the text says, who was of the evil one. I mean, it's unfortunate. But but I don't know if I don't know if you if you're Calvinist or not. I don't know if you believe in that doctrine that I don't know if you believe all believe in the doctrine of election, but I do. That before the foundation of the world, God had chosen us to be saved, those who are saved. And there's some who are elect, and that's what this passage actually helps us to, to see, that there's some who are who have been elected and some who are not. Now the, the, the but the issue there with election is we don't know who. <laughs> so that means we gotta witness to everybody. <laughs> because if we knew who were elected, guess what? We would just witness to them. 
You see? And so, but it shows us even here that, that even before they had the Holy Spirit, before you had the Holy Spirit, before any of this came into play, Abel had a good heart. He was righteous. What did Abel do to prove his righteousness? He gave what? He gave his best to God. And I believe that that's a good sign. Now, I believe that when you, I, I've been preaching on, on favor and, 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 you know, Sunday, I'm talking about why does God want you to prosper? I'm just saying, uh, oh, okay, good, right? But there are some other reasons I want to reveal on Sunday as to, as to, okay, we know we've taken the limits off. That's, that's a series I've been, take the limits off your life. Trust God, right? God will be blessed. God will bless you back. You, you're going to glorify. That's exactly what I closed out with, glorifying God, right? But there's another reason. There's some other reasons that God wants to bless you. God doesn't just want to bless you so you can sit back, right, and say, look what I've accomplished. I believe that the reason why some people have not yet experienced, I'm talking about super abundance, is because God knows that the moment he puts it in their hands, he gets no glory. That leads me, I say that, you know, you keep saying it's what's in the heart. Some people do things to get a reward. Right. Some people do, oh, I'm going to do this to get this from God. Right. Just do it because it's the right thing. Do it because it's the right thing. And that's what Abel did. He did it. I want to go there. Yeah. I want to go there. Because 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 I want to I want to show you something in Genesis. Is that Genesis 4? Yes, you're absolutely right, Ronnie. You're absolutely right. And that's, oh, man. Okay, no, it's not going to come. Okay. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think when you operate like that, it's the that's heart. you want to open up heaven to you. He will open up heaven yes. to you. Why? Yes. Because, because we have a clear illustration, right? See, here's the thing. Um, whatever you were before you got saved, you're not that anymore. Yes. Sincere. Yes. Sincere, yes. Sincere, yeah. You, you, you're not that. I, I can prove that to you. As much as the flesh want to go back there. Right. Yeah. If any man yeah. be in Christ, yeah. he's a new creature. See, I said to the I said to the Monday night class, and we, you know, lady been, t you know, talking with, listen, I used to lie about everything. I mean, listen, I just, I didn't need a reason to lie. But you want to know why? It's, you know what? You know how I started lying? Because my mama taught me how to lie. She used to tell me, tell your daddy you ain't got no, you ain't got no clothes. <laughs> tell him you need money for this. Tell him you need money for that. Tell him you need this. Tell him you need that. And she would actually put me out there to tell my dad that I needed, and then get the stuff, and I never get what I what I lied about. See, I was in an unfortunate situation, but lying then becomes. But I believe in all of this. God knew my heart. See, I I, I do believe that, right? And see, and so, but when I became a Christian, though, when I gave my life to Jesus, he, listen, if I lie, it feels like I didn't kill somebody. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit. That's why I said, if you're not converting, if you're not transforming, something is not going right in your Christian life. There's something missing. Now, I know we're supposed to get into this stuff here, but, but you know this, you know. Let, let's let's look at, let's look at Genesis. There. Golly, I could do this all night, you know. Genesis four, 
Now, 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 this is the part that really, really got me, you know. Now, now, the man had relations with his wife, Eve. Now, I want to, I want to kind of, uh, now, I want to show you this tool also. This is a great tool. Genesis 4, what? Verse 1, right? Now, this, this tool is called a parallel Bible, okay? And, and what happens with a parallel Bible? You can read it in different versions to get a better understanding of what the text is saying. Right? This, this is a, an amazing tool. They sell Bibles like this. It's called parallel Bibles. And, it, and it's about this thick, and you have like four versions in there. But again, you can get it right here like this. Okay, now, now, now the, the first one is the King James. The, new, the, the, the second one is the New American Standard, the NCV, New, new Century Version. I like the NLT because it's closest. It's, it's a scholarly version. I think that's what you have, Sister Queen. That's what you have, right, the NLT? Yes. Oh, you have Amplified. Okay. And then uh, there's the Message Bible, okay? Now, now, if you notice, look, it's, look what it says. Now, the man and his uh, man had relation with his wife, Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord, right? Now, look what the NCV says. Adam and had sexual relation. Now, you see, it, it's just a, it's a clearer cut. That's all it is. You, know, you don't use that to study but you use it to get clarity. Okay, I don't use these versions to, to I don't get in the pulpit and preach <laughs> with an NCV Bible. I ain't doing it. Now, I don't mind saying sexual relations, but, but it's not the original interpretation. Okay, so, because what they're doing here is they're making, they're making it a little clearer for you. Okay, this is what parallel parallelism does, okay? Oh, let me see something. Let me see. Okay. Medium. Let me see why. Okay, look. I like that. That's pretty good, right? Is that better? Yeah, I like that. Okay. Let's go to verse 2. I like what it says verse 2. And, 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 uh, and she gave birth. I'm in the second box. And she gave birth to Abel. And Abel was a what? Keeper of flocks. But Cain was a what? Tiller of the ground. All right, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an, watch this now, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Now, here's the thing. Obviously, they raised them this way, right? They raised them to know that when you, when you, uh, when you earn something, <laughs> principle is there, man. When you, when you make a living, you got to bring something to God, Right? Bring it back to God. I'm sure Adam taught him that, right? Abel, on his part, now let me let me just back up one. Let me just back up one real quick because it says something right there. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh yeah. This one. Look what it said. Now I want to show you something. It says you got to see this in the text. It says so. It came about in the course of time. That Cain, now remember now, we're reading uh, 1 John 3.12, which says that Cain was the evil one who slew his brother, right? And, and he, we're contrasting him in the context of him being of who? The devil. <laughs> All right? And the fact that he didn't love his brother. All right? Now watch this. Now, it came about, there's something here I want you to see. It came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. He brought an offering. Now, watch this. Now, Abel, on his part, brought the what? Now, see the difference? There's a difference between the offering... <laughs> And the firstling, it's a big difference. In other words, 
Cain thought he could tip God. Cain said, you know what? Man, shoot. This is all I got. I'm going to bring that to God. That's what most people do. Now, let me say this to you. Your giving is a reflection of you. Hello, somebody. What you give and how you give it reflects this. Reflects the heart. Because watch this. Watch what he says. He says he brought the first thing of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord did what? He regarded, had regard for Abel and for what? Now, now look what the NCV says. Abel brought the best part. Come on, help me somebody. From some of the firstborn of his flock, the Lord accepted Abel's, the Lord accepted Abel and what? His what? His gift. Now, if I back up one, back, you see why I like parallels? Look what it says here. Later, NCV, it says later, Cain brought some food from the ground as a gift to God. Now, see how plain it is? You, just even reading it, you see there's no, there's nothing in it. There's, it's, it's just... That's, that's it. I just pulled out whatever was in my pocket, my receipts and everything, and I just threw it at God. See? Because that's how I regard God. See? Now watch this. Watch what it says in the message. Right there, the last block. It says, time passed, Cain brought an offering to God from the produce of his farm. See that? Now, let's look at it. I want to see I want to see what the message says. Abel also brought an offering, but from the firstborn animals of his herd, choice cuts of what? Meat. God liked Abel and his what? See, here's the thing. What is it about what's the difference here? It's not about what they brought. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? If I'm tilling the ground, the only thing I got is fruit. I don't have choice cuts, meat. <laughs> but I do have some delicious pears. Oranges, grapes. I mean, I listen. I I got some. I got some stuff. Choice stuff. But then I have a choice. What's my choice? Do I bring it to God, my best, or do I just give Him leftovers? Our act of giving reflects this. It does. It's not only a matter of faith and trust. It's, it's, and, and listen, and if you don't see yourself prospering, it's good good question to ask. God, when I bring it, am I just throwing it at you? Or am I bringing it with a heart that says, before I even get there, God, I love you. And because I love you, because I love your kingdom, and because I love your word, and because I love what you have done in my life, God, here I am to offer you this gift. My best. See? Watch this. But for Cain and his offering... He had what? No regard. And as a result of that, so Cain became what? 
He didn't just become angry. He became very angry, right? He became very angry and his countenance fell. Look what the Lord said. Then the Lord, now, now this is the beautiful part about this passage. God sees everything, including the heart. He knows who is born of him, but he's given us a clue now. A, a peek into saying, okay, I, I know now. I know who's born of God. I can tell by their deeds. You see what I'm saying? I can tell by the way they carry themselves, right? I, I can tell by what they're practicing. It's evident, right? Watch what he said. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fell? He said, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Look at the NCV. If you what? If you do things well. Look at the NLT. You will be accepted if you do what is what? So is it wrong not to bring <laughs> your very best to God? You better believe it. The Lord reigns. Right. 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 Is that come on? Talk. There you go. See now you you're getting into Bible study. Now you're using your your sanctified imaginations, what I call it, and what you're getting into. You're saying, man, this has a whole lot of implications here. Listen, if God reigns and if he's king, and not only if he's just king, but if he's majesty and royalty, right? Why wouldn't I bring my best to him? I know why. Because I'm worried about me. Because what I'm practicing requires a certain lifestyle. It requires a certain amount of attention. <laughs> and so what I have to do, I have to have enough resources to fund my whatever it is. But, but I want you to say, he says, if you do things, things well. See, those are the types of things I hang on to. If I was to title this message, I would say do well. How to do well. See, because let me say, he says, but if you do not do them well, What is crouching? Sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for what? To do what? To do what? To master you. To devour you. To, to take over. Sin wants to rule over you. And it goes back to what he was talking about in the context in 1 John. So, but here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. You, here's the other implication of this passage. When you don't bring your best to God, what, what does that mean? Uh, say it. Say it. Say it again. That's 
That's that's deep. If I don't bring my best to him, and see, this is why some people have a hard time, right? This is how some people have a hard time. A hard time believing God. Because watch this. They're doing it, but that's how they do it. Mm-hmm. Right? They they figure, I did something. Mm-hmm. <coughs> that should satisfy you. So God should be satisfied with that. I, I was speaking to God on, on, the, on, the, on the plane to Miami. And it just dawned on me just a few seconds ago. What he really was saying. That's maybe why the Lord had me next to him. He said, I don't give to my church no more. Because they're so big. And, you know, they they have the, the huge church, Fellowship of the Woodland. They have all this stuff. They spend $10,000 to put props on the stage. I don't want my money going to that. But what he didn't realize. Is that he stopped doing well? You know, uh, I thought of an illustration that said that, and it makes perfect—it <laughs> it makes perfect sense to me. We take the illustration of a child, and the mama has taught him how to clean the house, how to wash the dishes, and he get the attitude that I'm not going to give my best when he can give his best. So really, the he. In a, be in a state of sin. I can see him being in a state of sin. I can see us being in a state of sin where we know we can do better, but yet we settle for that because we got another agenda. We got something else to do. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I ain't going to dry the dishes. Uh, I ain't going to sweep the floor because I got to get back to my game. And that's what it's all about. We got something else to do, so we ain't going to give our best. We don't think about it. Well, well, see, and that's and that's what I've been trying to 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 teach a church for nine years is that listen if I stop coming to church. If I stop giving God my best, it doesn't matter. It, it, it means nothing to him. He does not regard it. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even want it, but I throw it at him anyways. And what happens is Satan knows that the church has power. This he knows. He knows when the body of believers come together, there's power there. And he he will always try to keep the church at a disadvantage because he knows that the moment that love enters that building, (laughs) boy, you better watch out. You see, and so what he does is he gets us to start taking shortcuts it's not growing so what we're going to do is we're going to start doing this you don't have to give you you don't even have to support the church You, you don't have to do anything just show up God put a gift in you I talked about this Tuesday night. That needs to be used for his glory. You have to use it. It was a gift. And you know, some of us, we get these gifts, and you know, for Christmas, you know what we do? We, we put it in the closet, and we never use them. See? Now, now, now let, me, let, me, let me finish this up. Let me finish this up, because I, I want to show you something here. Watch what he said. He says, if you do well... Will not your conscience be lifted up? And if you do not do well, and and what does he tell him to do? To give his best. best. 
to give his best. He says, why? Sin is what? Re sin, sin is ready to attack you. Sin wants you, but you must rule over it. How do you rule over sin? You say, today I'm no longer going to give God just anything. Because it's sin, it's sinful when we don't give him our best. If I'm going to serve him, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to, listen, if I'm going to preach tomorrow, I've already studied. I'm ready. All right? If, if I'm going to, if, I, if we're going to go outreach, I'm prayed up. I'm ready. You find what I'm saying? Whatever we need to do, I'm doing it, and I'm giving not just 1%, not just 50%, but I'm giving 100%. That's something that you have to practice in the midst of discouragement. You know how God can take, take us and make this thing real to us he will put us in a discouraging situation to see if you still got the zeal do you still have the fire do you still have the joy do you still have the, the, the mind to bring him your best see listen we give our attention to a lot of things Well, how about our church? How, how about the kingdom? Bigger than the church, it's the kingdom. People are dying, going to hell every day. And we're sitting right next to them. Anyways, watch what he says next. Oh, boy. Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about. Now, now notice God gave him the solution, right? And God told him, God gave him a way of escape. God did not, God did not leave Cain without a solution, even though he was in depravity. He says, sin is at your door. The NIV says, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It, its desire is to have you. But you must what? Master it. You, you see that? You must what? Yeah, listen. Whatever is, is, it wants to have control over you, you got to master that thing. Sin is present. It wants you to say, you know what? I'm not doing this. I don't want to do this anymore. Watch this. Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel. And what? He killed him. You killed me because I gave my best. But it was bigger than that. You killed me because you see God blessing me. And now you assassinate me. Jealousy. That's the fruit of the flesh. Sin took control of Abel, of Cain. And he killed his brother. Now watch this. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Now look at his attitude. He said, I don't know. This is how he's saying it now, okay, in, in, in grammatical construction. I don't know. Why are you asking me? Am I my brother's keeper? See, a lot of people use this, but they don't understand the context of this. 
he wasn't saying like I'm my brother's keeper like like how it's suggested. No, he said I don't care. It ain't my it ain't my what I ain't supposed to watch over him. That ain't my job, you God. See what sin will do? <laughs> watch this. Watch this. Uh, look 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 at look at look at what the message says. God said to Cain, where's Abel? He said, how should I know? Am I his babysitter? <laughs> look, look at the NCV. Later, the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? Cain answered, I don't know. Is it my job to take care of my brother? Now, this is a classic scripture and in and, and, and Bible study that, 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 I, that I just mentioned that people do this. They'll grab this piece right here. Am I my brother's keeper? We've used it for themes, for brotherhoods. We've, we've, we've used it for all kinds of stuff. But if we only knew the context of what it was written in, we wouldn't use it. <laughs> I mean, we can still use it in a positive way, but I'm just saying. You know, now watch this. He said to him, he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now, you are what? Cursed from the ground. Which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. From now on, you'll get nothing but curses from the ground. How did the ground get cursed? Huh? Cain. Cain didn't understand the bigger picture. Just like Adam and Eve did not understand the bigger picture. This is a generational curse going down right here. They didn't understand the bigger picture. Now, even though God said, curse be the ground because of you, Adam, he's just reiterating. He says, he says, uh, he says, and now you'll be cursed in your work with the ground, the same ground where your brother's blood fell and where your hands killed him. Now, let me say this. I can use this passage in a lot of different ways, but I'll use it in this way, seeing that we talked about it already. When you don't give God your best, and you assassinate people everything you do will not prosper you will get up and try to do it and this leads me to examine myself tonight seriously am i giving god am i giving you my best is that why I keep trying to launch and I keep falling? That's why I keep trying to see a way out and every time I try to see a way out, I keep falling back down? Failure to launch? You see, because the beauty of a believer in this state is 1 John 1 and 9. <laughs> you don't have to stay in that condition. See, but when you find out about this, and when you learn the concepts, you got to what? Turn to God and repent. Now look what God says next. God said to him, when you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You'll be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to him, said to the Lord, now watch this, my punishment is too great to what? You should have thought about that when you had that attitude of see when you're blessed people will envy you. Seriously. But you got you have to you have to you have to you have to continue to not apologize for what God is doing in your life. You don't have to apologize because he blesses you Amen. and your children. Don't you ever apologize. 
If somebody wants me to have, I'll have it. See, for his glory, right? Look what he says next. He says, Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from the faith from your face I will be hidden. And I will be a what? Vagrant? He accepted it, didn't he? And a wanderer on the earth. And whoever so the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken to him. What? And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would what? Kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of what? Eden. Well, I'll say this. God was merciful to him. Now, let's go back to our passage. Oh, man, these allergies. Is that 1 John or 2 John? 1 John what? All right, now let's read it with all of this in mind, okay? The fact that God did not kill him and, and actually stood up for him suggests what? God's what? There you go. See, God is not as hard as we think. He was cursed, but he was still loved by God. Because he said, anyone who touch him. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? He had to live with this guilt for, a long, for all the rest of his life. Okay? But he says, not as Cain, who what? Who was evil and slew his, slay, slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? We know what reason now, right? Because his deeds were what? evil and his what brothers was what righteous. righteous verse 14 is that verse 14 now 13. I'm sorry verse 13 I got I skipped the verse look at verse 13 now don't be surprised brethren oh my gosh come on help me somebody if the world what Now, as you read this, what were the questions on your on your sheet of paper? You were supposed to write in reference to Genesis four one through sixteen. What new insights uh, does this shed on the verse Genesis? What new insights would you say is shed on the passage now? Mean that you read Genesis, and then and then reading, then reading First uh, John. Okay. All right. The one who is the one who is righteous. Right, uh, the one who's righteous practices what righteousness. Uh, the one who does not love his brother is not righteous. Right, it gives us an illustration to show us that the deeds that if you have hatred for people, you follow what I'm saying that 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 hey, it shows where you are, who your daddy is. Right? It shows that your daddy is the devil. Right? When you don't bring your best to God. Right? That's another thing we learn, right? It's it's what? It's sin. And we should always bring our best to God, right? And and then it says, and then and then it says here, determine why this verse was dropped into the center 
of a chapter on God's love. Why was it dropped just in the center of everything? Because it serves as a what? As an illustration, as a picture to show us what righteousness and unrighteousness looks like. In other words, it was an illustration, right? It says, try to think of an example in your own life in which you see a contrast between righteous and evil actions and consequences that results. When in your own life have you acted as Cain? <laughs> when have you suffered as Abel did? What does this verse speak to each? How does this verse speak to each observation? Now, what I like is the next verse. He says, don't be surprised who? Notice who he's addressing. He says, don't be surprised who? Brethren, if the world, what? Hates you. See, that's the price you got to pay. And that's in and, and context, he's saying, Abel, in other words, look at what happened to Abel. Don't be surprised. See? For we know... What, what is it? For we know that we have passed out of what? Death into life. Here's how you know. Because we love the who? The brethren. Now, it's not talking about your brother or sister. We love the people of God so much so we care about them. And he who does not love abides in what? Death. <laughs> Everyone who hates his brother is a what? Like who? That's it. And you know that no murderer... Has what? Eternal life abiding in him. So the question is, will we see Cain again? Probably not. This is some deep stuff, man. All right. I'll stop there because I want to get into another slide that I have here. Um, when we start talking about interpretation, oh, okay. let me, uh, let me go here. So, uh, you know what? Let me do this. All right, so the four steps is this. Observation, interpretation, correlation, but the last step is actually application. So what we just did there for the last 30, 40 minutes here is we just did observation. All right, so now what we want to move, when we move, when in Bible study methods, we move, we're moving now into interpretation. Now, in interpretation, the question that we're trying to answer in interpretation is, what does it mean? All right, what does it mean? What does this passage, what is this passage talking about? Now that I know my author... Uh, now that I know what's going on, your quest is for meaning now. Unfortunately, too much of Bible study begins with interpretation and furthermore, it usually ends there. All right? But I'm going to show you now, you know, a little bit of what we must do in, in interpretation. All right? In uh, interpretation. So, let me see if we can get this one more time. All right? Observation. What do I see? All right? Interpretation. What does it what? Mean. Those, those are the questions. Correlation. Where does it fit? 
and an application, how does it work? All right? The more time you spend observing, the less time you spend interpreting. Now notice, we observe this passage together, and pretty much now in interpretation, we can get right to the point and get on with that. The more time you spend observing, the less time you spend what? Interpreting, okay? The more time you spend, the less time you, you spend in ob observation, the more time and mistakes, uh, the, the more time and mistakes in interpretation, right? I'm sorry, the less time you spend time observing the passage, you're going to make a lot of mistakes in your interpretation because then you lose the, the context and you'll, you'll forget what setting it's in and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, the problem with most Bible study begins and ends in interpretation, all right? Um, let me do this real quick. Uh, let's go to this. Okay, this is what you have in your book. And I, I'm just kind of trying to keep everything on the page so that way you can kind of see it and understand it because I don't want to take you nowhere else and then you just be like, well, where is he taking me? All right. Okay, can you see that? Yeah? All right. I went to the eye doctor today and they told me I have zero vision. Okay. Our observation of a passage should have stirred up interest yet challenging question leading us to the second stage in Bible study, interpretation. Fortunately, we do not have to run to a commentary or a study Bible for answers, though these are helpful tools to check our conclusion. Using the following six methods, all right, as needed to tackle a variety of questions and make sure to familiarize yourself with the three principles of interpretation below. Ready? Principle number one. Your goal... Uh -oh. Your goal is to discern the author's what? Intent. The author's intent I'm sorry, the author's intended meaning to the what? Original audience. Unfortunately, most people begin Bible study by asking, what does the passage mean to who? To me. All right, so where there may be multiple possible applications to my life, there's only one meaning. The author's intended meaning, and we must first seek this out. This involves... Three important stages. Now, you have this in your handout so you can read it. I just want to kind of go over it with you, okay? Number one, always start your study with what? Prayer. You know what I found out is that sometimes I'm stuck. I don't know. I, I just get stuck, and, and I can't get any clarity. I can't get any. I, I'm not making any movement in the passage, and what I do is I stop immediately, and I begin to pray. Actually, before I begin, I begin with prayer. Okay, always begin with prayer. Number two, be very careful to avoid reading your 21st century circumstances and theological issues into the text, as they will skew our understanding. I think, um, Brother Cleveland, you said last week, you really blessed me with that, that the term uh, majesty has a different meaning in today's society, you know what I mean? Over the years, it's been watered down. You know, in our 20th century mindset, majesty just means nothing. But back in that time, it meant what? A lot, all right? The third thing is work diligently to see the text from the point of view of the original readers. To do this, dig into the number one, dig into the what? Historical and cultural background using Bible dictionary and commentaries. Spend a few moments thinking about the original audience's religious understanding by asking, what books of the Bible 
did they have access to? What did they know about God, about Jesus, and about salvation? All right. So just to give you a, a little, uh, a little illustration here. If I were to go back to word search, uh oh, uh, and I was to go to my Bible knowledge commentary. And I was to back it up to our verse. What verse was that? Yeah, First John. Okay, three and what? Twelve, right? All right. But before I go to verse twelve, the first thing I want to do is I want to go up here to intro, right? And what I want to do is I want to get into the background of this book. So here's what I do first. I say, okay, the first epistle of John is an intensely practical letter addressing Christian, addressed to what? Christian readers. It warns against the danger of what? False teachings and exhorts believers to live, live um, believers to, to lives of what? Obedience to God and love for their brothers and sisters. Its controlling theme is fellowship with God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, so now I'm getting to understand why he wrote it, who he wrote it to. See, see how all this is like, in interpretation, this is where all your background information is starting to make sense. All right? All right? Uh, then you know your author. Who's the author? Uh, John, background. The letter contains no hint about the identity or location of the readers beyond the fact that they are what? So we know that 1 John is being written to who? Oh, man, that's big. That's huge based upon what we just read. That's, that's major. That's a major fact. And I'll write that down. This was written to Christians. This has nothing to do. So when 1 John 1 and 9 comes into play, you know, people use 1 John 1 and 9 to witness. Right? You, do you know that? People use 1 John 1 9 to say, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's not for the unbeliever. Why? Because it was written to who? Come on, help me. See, what you, just, you just learned something. So everything that's in this book is not written to unbeliever. It's written to us. So it should hold a little bit more. Right? I just found that out. Now watch this. Since the church... Since uh, early church tradition associates John with the Roman providence of Asia in western Turkey, it has often been taught that the readers live there. Uh, this may be especially since the association is what? Confirmed by revelation. So they were, in, they were in Asia. They were in the providence of Asia, actually. All right? So, so we, we know that it, culturally there's an eastern mindset here. Oh, man, that's rich. That's rich. All right? The, re the readers have been confronted with what? False teaching. Whom John called what? Antichrist. So we know that he's writing to believers who were, who were in Asia, who were being, who the church was being infiltrated with what? false teaching. The exact character of the false teaching has, has, has much been discussed. Many have thought uh, it was Gnostics who held to the strict dualism in which spiritual and material things were sharply distinguished. Others have seen the letter as directed against uh, dichotism, di uh, the belief that Jesus, that Jesus' humanity was not real and that he only appeared to have a physical body. Now, see, now this is, this is holding to, this is deep. All right, so this is what, this is the belief system. So what we're, what we're finding out as I'm studying this passage is that in the midst of an Eastern mindset and a potential of discrediting Jesus, as Savior and Lord and as God, right? I better bring my best to him. <laughs> Amen. I ought to love my brothers 
Why? Because the background is, is rich, right? Now watch this. Because now I'm getting interpretation. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to Christians. We don't know exactly which church in that providence, but he's, pre he's teaching all the Christians in that, in that particular area. All right? Um, and then it goes on to give us a couple things. And what I usually do, I mean, you can read all this stuff, but, but what I usually do is I kind of go right here to the end. It kind of tells you. In any case, the letter was no, was, was no doubt intended ultimately for the what? For the what? This is, a, this is a warning book. That's rich. So I would make that in my interpretation. What does that mean? What does the text mean? What does this passage about Cain and Abel have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with a lot. But now that I'm getting ready to interpret it, see, look at this. Um, he says uh, it, it's it's under, ultimately for the warning and what instruction of the what of what the whole church or churches to which it was sent. So this book should be taught in church. <laughs> That's pretty heavy, man. And its truths are ritually what? Applicable for every Christian experience. W when was it written? What date was it written? First set, it, it, was, it, was, it was written virtually noting the epistle indicates specific uh, date or period. Many uh, conservatives suggest the date of late in the first century A.D., about the time or, or shortly after the writing of the fourth gospel, but a good case can be made for dating the gospel of John sometime prior to 70 AD. If this is done, there is no practical reason why uh, 1 John may not be assigned to the same period. Now, this time period thing, because they have a lot of discrepancies, discrepancies in it, uh, it's it's still important to understand what date and time it was written. You can look it up in timelines. Okay, um, let me conclude here by saying this. It says these deductions, like I said, I always go to the last paragraph because it usually just gives it to me in a nutshell. These deductions are far from firm, but they might be taken to the point to the date for the epistle somewhere between what? A.D. 60 and 65. Now, here's what I would do. I would look up and see what was going on during A.D. 60 and 65 to get a better picture as to the background of this passage, right? And say, well, well, at, this at that time, particular time, time in, this in this area, exactly. All right. Uh, now, let me go now to uh, show you this. All right. What chapter were we in? Three. Chapter 3, verse what? All right, so now let me show you the beauty of the Bible knowledge commentary in order to get interpretation of the passage before you start digging it apart and pulling it apart, right? What verse? All right, right here, 12. Now, let me show you how this works. If I go to my Bible knowledge commentary now, look what it does. It now gives me meaning, interpretation to the verse now. Look what it says. John here made it plain that his ambitions, uh, admi ad admonitions were directed to what? We know this. This is the message you Christians have heard from the beginning. We Christians should what? Now, instead of using brethren, he's, us he's using the word what? Christians, exactly. But before telling his audience precisely what love is, he first, first told them what it is not. So now, in my interpretation of that passage, if I go to present it, what I would say first in my lesson, I would say, the first thing we want to, the first thing that the writer was do. this is how I say it, the writer is, is first addressing, before he addresses what love is, he addresses what love is not by giving us 
an illustration of what Cain and Abel. That is proper interpretation. See that? And that's, and that, I mean, we, we already said that earlier, but the reason why we went to the, to the commentary is just to validate what we just said. So in, ter in interpretation, you're finding meaning as to why he was saying what he was saying and who he was saying it to, right? And, and what the purpose is. So watch this. Uh, he says, it is most certainly not the kind of action Cain exhibited to, towards his brother Abel. Cain murdered his what? His brother. And in that action, he was one of the what? Belonging to is what? Misleading. So the reason for this murder was Cain's jealous resentment of his brother's superior what? Righteousness. And, and, and that, now you're understanding in interpretation what it means. Watch this. In saying this, John touched a sensitive nerve since hatred towards other Christians is often what? Prompted by a feeling of what? Guilt about one's own life. Come on, help me. This is real stuff right here. As compared with that person's. See, and that's what's happening. When you see a per and see, now, I'm, now this is application. When you see a person doing well and you're not doing well, we have a tendency to slaughter that person. That's the illustration, that's the interpretation of what John was trying to pull out by using that passage. Now that's pretty heavy, ain't it? But in our observation, the reason why this doesn't surprise us, because we spent 45 minutes <laughs> in observation to conclude with the commentary in interpretation. The commentary just gives you a richer wording and, you know what I mean, it puts it in its, in its proper wording so you can say, oh, man, yeah, that's it. That's what that, so that's what that means. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, earlier, I, I was looking there to see if it says where it says, uh, let me see, where it says we cannot sin. Verse 9, right here, exactly. It says, as was pointed out in, in connection with verse 6, adding such phrase as continue to go on, to John's statements about sinning is not justified on the basis of the Greek text. As before the statements are, as before the statements are what? Absolute. One who is born of God does not sin precisely because God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. God's seed is his nature. Given to each believer at what? At salvation. The point here is that a child partakes of the nature of his parent. The thought of, sin, of a sinless parent who begets a child who only sins a little is far from the author's mind. As always, John dealt in what? In stark contrast. All sin is what? Devilish. It does not stem from the believer's regenerated nature. God's seed, but the child of God cannot and does not sin. The explanation here is the same given in verse 6. The new man or the new self, it is an what? An absolute perfect new creation by insisting on this point, John was seeking to refute a false conception about sin. Sin is not nor ever can be anything but what? Satanic. It can never spring from what a Christian truly is at the level of his regenerated being. Now watch this. What he was really saying when he said we cannot sin... He was saying it's impossible, right, if you've been born again 
to keep practicing sin. It doesn't come from your nature. It comes from a what? Satanic nature. And you should discern. Come on, help me somebody. This should give us a, 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 a boost or a, a, a motivation to say, you know what? When I see myself doing that, that is of the devil. And the devil does not live in me. He is influencing me to keep living like this. That's what he means when he says, cannot sin. See, that's good interpretation. All right? And so, and so he says, um, he goes on to say, little children, literally the phrase uh, of this verse is by, by this, is a man of, is by by this are manifest the children of God and the children of the devil. The words by this probably refers back to the whole previous discussion, but sharply differ, differentiating between sin and righteousness. John made a plain made plain the fundamental way in which God's children see. Notice here's what's so important about this this whole book. What we just understood about about interpretation. The fact that he's talking to Christians. It's possible. See, and, and there's possibilities here. The key is his idea, is his word what? Manifest in which the ideas presented in 2.29 and 3.1 are touched again because a child of God is sinless at the what? At the core. We are sinless at the core. When you accept Christ, at the core you're sinless. Watch this. My gosh. At the, uh, it, says, it says sinless at the core of his being. He can never be what? Manifest through sin as a child of the devil. So it's incorrect to say the devil made me do that. It's incorrect to say about a Christian, oh, she got a demon on her. Or the devil is inside of her. Yeah. Incorrect to say that. Because once you, if we understand the ramifications of salvation and being a child of God, at our core being, we're sinless. My, my, my. Now, is that deep? Watch this. While an unsaved person can display his true nature through what? Sin. A child of God what? So is this book really helping us to identify what a true Christian is like? You better believe it. I think you need to read it again. It's helping us to identify, I'm going to close that a real Christian does not live in sin, does not practice sin. It's not a way of life for them. And watch this, and they will bring their best to God because it's in their nature to do that. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Golly. Look what it says. It says, it says, when a Christian sins, he conceals who he really who he really is rather than making it what? You ever notice that? So if the reader perceives someone doing real righteousness, then but only then can they perceive this action as a true product of a what? New birth. And can thus behold God's love. This consideration is what? Critical to John's advancing argument. Notice what it says, discerning love for the brother. So in interpretation, what you're doing is you're going into what the author really meant when he first said what he said. And that's why I showed you this. 
and you have this, you can read it yourself. Okay? Alright? Study the grammar. Read the chapter that came later. Let the scripture interpret scripture. Check your conclusions and allow clear allow clear passages to illuminate, illuminate ambiguous passages. Alright? And here are some methods. Use the context. Remember how we were doing uh, the parallel Bible? Uh, compare multiple translations. Number three, look up key what? Key words. Study uh, cross-reference passages. Look up what? Bible. Look up what? Background info. Tackle tough questions. Like, we had some tough questions on there, right? And we tackled them, right? All right. Okay, homework assignment. In the Word of God, let us always be ready to give you our best. Let us love each other, God. Love the brethren, Lord. Treat each other with respect and love each other, Father God, as you loved us, Lord. I just pray for everyone here tonight that you would bless us. Give us safe traveling grace as we leave this place tonight. We love you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. Let me say this. Uh